So let's play. This is called the opposite game. Here's how it goes. It's pretty simple. I'm going to say a word, and you're going to say back to me the opposite word. So for example, if I say black, you're going to say? Beautiful. Let's go. On. In. Love. Health. Happy. Life. Positive. And play. Ah. <laughs> well, according to Dr. Stuart Brown of the National Institute for Play, the opposite of play is not work. It's depression. The World Health Organization predicts that by the year 2020, the second leading cause of disease globally will be depression. I don't know about you, but I find that really depressing. Any guesses of what the leading cause of disease globally will be by the year 2020? Heart disease. And yes, someone already said it. When I think of those two things together, I think about stress. And when I think about stress, I think about the way we work and what we tell ourselves about work, that work is laborious, that it's hard, that it's something that we have to do. Here's how we look when work is something that we have to do. <laughs> and if that's what it looks like on the outside, you can only imagine what it looks like on the inside. Even our vernacular in organizations around wellness, we talk about work-life programs as though work and life happen at separate times. My proposition to you is if we increase our play, we will decrease depression, we will decrease stress, and we will increase the quality and quantity of our lives. And what is life all about anyway? Really, you ask any parent what they want for their children, and they will say, I want my children to be happy. Of the top five deathbed regrets, one of them is, I wish I'd let myself be happier. Isn't that what it's all about, really? And I think for any of us to tune into that for ourselves, we have to ask ourselves why we do what we do. Do you know why you do what you do? I know why I do what I do. I get to help people have a life at work. I study things like happiness and positivity and resilience. It's great. Somebody once call, called me nauseatingly optimistic, and I thought it was a compliment. <laughs> I also help people to be authentic and real. So I knew it was my turn. I was being interviewed for a radio show uh, about a piece I wrote on positive workplaces. The host said, among other things, she was going to ask me why I do what I do. So I knew the time had come when I would share my story publicly. And I knew I had to tell my children first. Allie was 11 and Max was 8. I had two weeks to prepare for this radio show. I waited until the night before. In fact, I waited till bedtime of the night before. In fact, lights out of bedtime of the night before to talk to them. As I started walking down the hall to their rooms, I was starting to talk myself out of it. I mean, I had another story. There's another reason that I do what I do. I could tell that one instead. Losing my dad as a teenager is a big part of why I chose this career path. My dad literally worked himself to death at the age of 45. It wasn't until after he passed away that we realized just how much stress he was under, how overwhelmed he was by his work. I remember thinking, I wish we'd known that. I also remember, even as a young person, thinking, isn't work about making a living, not making a dying? So. I could tell that story instead, and I could put off telling Allie and Max a little while longer. Because, like, they're kids, right? You know, I want them to think that life's about sunshine and happiness and lollipops. 
and perfect parents. Of course, I'm kidding because they, they know their father isn't perfect. <laughs> so I kept going because I knew it was time. I'd literally been thinking about it since they were born. Allie was laying in her room reading. Max was in his room across the hall playing. Hey, Max, join me in Allie's room. I want to talk to you guys about something. Max walked over with trepidation. Of course, I realized he thought he was in trouble, which would only bring sunshine and joy to his sister because it's a good day if your brother's in trouble. Max sat on the side of Allie's bed. She stayed laying. I knelt in front and rested my arms on her bed. So you know how I told you I'm going on the radio tomorrow, right? Which I'm totally stoked about. That's really cool for me. Well, there's something about me that you don't know. And it might come out on the radio, and I, I want you to hear it from me first. Allie immediately put her book on her chest and moved her hand over to rest on my arm. What? said Max. Oh, I, I wanted to tell you that I was married before. Married before? Like when? Oh, it was a long time ago. It was before I met Dad, before you were born. It was just after I got out of university. Well, like who too? What's his name? His name was Kelly. He was really nice. Well, where is he? Like as if I kept him in the basement or something. <laughs> did, you, did you break up? No, unfortunately, he passed away. How? Did he have an accident, Mom? No. He took his own life. <sighs> that was the first breath I took. Even then. There were a few tears. Max had one more question. What did he do that for, Mom? I said, I don't know. He must have been really sad for him to have kept that inside and not shared it with people who cared about him. Okay, I'll admit, I might have gone into a mini presentation on the importance of letting people you care about know how you're feeling. I may have, have done that, that's possible. Allie hadn't spoken the entire time. Just had her hand on my arm. Finally, she spoke. Are you okay, Mom? That's it. No judgment. She wasn't judging me. Max wasn't judging me. In fact, I'm pretty sure he was already distracted by something he saw on the floor. <laughs> My current husband wasn't judging me. It appeared there was only one person judging me. They just cared. That's it. Well, guess what? After all that, it didn't come up on the radio show that next day. <laughs> and not in the seven years since that night I talked to Allie and Max. Not until today because something's happened and I have to speak up. After Kelly died, I moved to Winnipeg and wanted to move on with my life. Luckily, I got a job shortly after I moved here. A couple of days in, my new manager took me to lunch. He knew I was a widow. He knew I was 27. That's the information you provide to human resources when you start a job. He started off offering me his condolences. He asked how long I'd been married. I said, it had been eight months. I prayed he didn't ask me what happened. I know I would have lied if he did. I was not ready. Thankfully, he didn't. But then he said something I will never forget. 
I envy you. I look back at him blankly. I did not feel very envious at the time. He said, wait, let me explain. I envy you because you have the opportunity right now to choose the kind of life you want to live. Lots of us don't think about that, Derry, till we're a lot older, if at all. You get a chance right now to decide. I envy you that. I'll admit it was a long time before I realized really what he was saying. And then I thought he was right. I can choose the kind of life I want to live, and so can you. So I did the therapy thing. I opened up, I made friends with all those ugly, squiggly parts inside, and I moved on. I met a great guy, I got married, had a couple of highly intelligent children, and I kept doing the work that I love to do. Then someone I care about became depressed, and he's now in prison. And that's not a metaphor. He's in actual prison. He doesn't belong there. He's like you. He's like me. He's just a guy trying to live his life. And then something happened at work that he deemed a failure that has caused a downward spiral. I think about him, you know, and I think maybe he's been in prison for a long time. Not the metal and concrete prison in which he finds himself, but a different kind of prison. The prison of appearances, the prison of judgments, the prison of shame. It might be, by the way, a prison that looks familiar to a lot of us. It certainly does to me. So I can choose to make a difference, to positively impact mental health globally. And so can you. Mental health is a serious topic, but I believe practicing positive mental health is seriously easy. It is so easy that an 11 and 8 year old can teach you. If you think back to the night that I told Allie and Max my story, they did three things that are central to positive mental health, that are central to play, to life, uh, to, to work. They were curious, caring, and connected. And what's interesting is when you're curious, caring, and connected, you can't judge. It's impossible. Yourself or others. We can make these predictions disappear by having more play. Because work, play, and life all happen at the same time. And here's how we look when we believe that to be true. It's written all over our eyes, in our smiles, and all over our bodies. And if this is what it looks like on the outside, you can imagine what it looks like on the inside. The Canadian Mental Health Commission estimates that one in five of us is experiencing a mental health challenge right now. If you add in workplace stress and burnout, it's more like one in three. So look at the people on either side of you. And today and every day, look for opportunities to be curious, caring, and connected. You don't know what difference you might make. You could save a life. Maybe your own. Thank you. Thank you.